single party state with a heavy police presence. People don't trust each other optically. Uh, the buildings, what are they? Is, is, this, is this a ministry? Is it a hotel? Is it a block of flats? You know nothing. I had no Cyrillic in my head. Um, all of those impressions are vivid and wonderful for the first few days and then they gradually dissipate and you get used to everything, to the smells, the not looking at people, uh, the, bad, the bad faces, the suspicious faces and all those things. So it, it has always been a wonderful thing for me at the, at the right point to move into a story. Uh, in the case of the Mission Song, my most recent book, I, there was a long time that I wrote and studied the subject before I went to Congo. The, the principle of travel for me, if I'm researching a book, is to take my secret sharer, as Conrad called it, with me. I mean by that, that if it's George Smiley, or it was in those days, I would know what part he was playing. When we entered a room and we talked to people, my notes would be Smiley's notes. Or if it was a different character, uh, as in the present book, if it was Salvo, in any encounter that reflected the fiction, my notes, all my notes would, to myself would be from his eyeline. And so there was never an objective record. I didn't keep a diary. And every night, then, I always have these stupid bits of paper in my pocket and, and a couple of pens. And, and every night, however tired I am or however drunk I am, uh, I write the stuff and into a book, uh, I mean, longhand. And I still, I still don't type. I still write only longhand. And have you ever been afraid that uh, somebody might want to stop you from telling all these stories who are still happening? Or yeah, I, I think, um, I, I mean, I'm as timid as the next man. I, I, don't, uh, I don't enjoy danger. I don't enjoy being threatened. It's, I think my attitude to it is like that of a photographer. For as long as I can look through the lens, I feel protected. I've seen that in, at war fronts. There's a kind of alienation. So for as long as I have a fictional purpose, as long as I have a purpose as a writer, I don't really feel frightened by the situation I'm in. I think that I, I had more reason to be frightened after writing The Constant Gardener. Um, I, I think that, I mean, the pharmaceutical industry at its worst has uh, quite a record of murder. Uh, in Spain, there have been several cases of people wanting to tell about the malpractices of the industry uh, who've then been murdered. Uh, there was even a man who gave evidence, sought sanctuary from the police, was given protection, and was murdered while in protection. That's not something that is ordered from Geneva. Uh, that is something that happens on the ground where a local manager or a local representative will take his responsibilities a little too far, uh, probably without consulting anybody. But I thought that that could happen to me in one circumstance. I thought it might have happened to me in Kenya, but I've never been back to Kenya after writing that book. You have many countries yet to visit. <laughs> <laughs> there was a really bad moment in the Congo where we were, we had a driver, and I had my, my two friends, my escorts, the woman, aides, in, in, still beautiful in her middle life, and the man who was 28. And we got into what a situation that could have been dangerous, with a crowd and people gathering around the car, and, and uh, a little bit of excitement going on. And I suddenly realized who I was, that as far as they were concerned, I was a monstrous liability. That here they were with this 75-year-old writer sitting in their car, and if something did go wrong, they would feel dreadfully responsible. And I felt very guilty about having put them in that position. Why John Le Carré? Why this uh, name? Well, I've told a lot of lies about this, so <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you one. Yes. <laughs> um, no, I'll tell you the truth. It's of no longer any importance. I used to say, uh, first of all, I was in the British Foreign Service at that time, and my employing department said, 
okay, you can write these books as long as you show them to us first, but you must use a pseudonym, a nom de plume. So I said, okay. So I then went, this is the truth, I went to my publisher at that time, as soon as I was, had a publisher, that was Victor Golanx. And, and Victor was a very distinguished immigrant Polish Jew, a refugee from Nazi persecution who had set up a publishing house. And he said, oh, my advice is choose two good monosyllables, like sort of Hank Smith, that would be very good. <laughs> so I said, well, Victor, your name ends in CZ, and everybody knows who you are. And then I thought I would, uh, um, tactically speaking, I would construct a name that had three pieces, not two. And I would make it a little bit foreign and a little bit hard to pronounce because it catches the eye. I wandered through bookshops and looked at all those names, and just optically it prints itself on the retina. We, we recognize some names immediately and never forget them. And so I put this name together as a cold-blooded tactical exercise. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then later, when I was forced to explain it, I, journalists sometimes simply do not want to hear the truth. <laughs> and so I found myself making up stories about being on a bus looking down in London and seeing a tailor's shop with this name. Dreadful stories. And they all conflicted. I always forgot what lie I'd told last. So It was not your code name. Th no. no, no it, that's, and, uh, and people made amazing things out of it. The French said it was fantastic. Carré means a check suit. It's a number at roulette. If you have a, a numero carré, it's a, you put a, a chip on each corner of a number. If you go to a bal carré, then the girls ask the men to dance. <laughs> Unbelievable. I never knew what idiocy I had created around me. But I have to tell you, Jane thinks I may have talked too much and spoiled the beef. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is the bit your audience is going to enjoy. <laughs> no, <laughs> they will envy us. <laughs> let them, yes, let them, that's part of it. <laughs> Jane. And that's for you. So, it's to you. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for coming, making the long journey. Uh, if we just swim after lunch, if we swim that way, we will go past Southern Ireland and then on to America. So, Land's End, which is the end of England, yes. is down there. Ah, it's down there. Yeah. Not the end of the world. Is it? That's the end of the world. And you can, you can just walk for four hours over the cliff yes. and you get to the end of the world. Beyond that, there lies nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and the Cornish coastal footpath it goes all along here. So you can see that yeah. green line yeah. going over and then you can walk, walk forever. Till you meet, till you reach barbarism. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.